when I got to Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, there was a big problem, one I had not foreseen. I put in for my first visit to my hometown in Washington, North Carolina. I purchased my ticket and boarded a bus to take my first journey home after entering the military, making sure that I had a, a straight through bus. I got to Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. The driver collected a little stub of everyone that was already seated. And when he got to me, he said, uh, I want you to get up and go to to the rear of the bus. And I told him I was comfortable seated where, seated where I was, where I was. He didn't say anything. He just kept on with his business, collecting the tickets. So he came back to the front. And as he passed the two-seater, I'm by the window, and a Marine on temporary duty, had been on temporary duty from Fort Dix, I reached out with my ticket, and he said, uh, I'm not taking your ticket, and he kept straight to the door. He got off the bus and came back in about 15 minutes, and he said, I want everyone on this bus to get off except that woman that refused to move to the rear. She can stay here until this bus moves out, but it's not going any place tonight. You know, it's sort of like a shock that I just hear something that I, I'm understanding what the man is saying, but I can't stay on this bus by myself. And when I entered the bus station, I proceeded to the ticket window. And when I got to the ticket window, the lady behind the ticket window, she pulled the curtain down and dimmed the lights. It's sort of like in a movie, you know? When she did that, I turned around, and there was a tall guy pushing a broom. And he said to me, Miss, don't you know where you are? I said to myself, oh, God, Sarah, you are in trouble. I went back out to the line, and I said to the driver again, is something wrong with my ticket? He said, no, but you're, you're not riding this bus tonight. And the policeman was standing about five feet away. And they said to the driver, is this the one? The driver said, yes. The one got on one side, one on the other side. He really didn't manhandle me like most people really think, you know. But it was all like in a movie that night, you know, one that probably most people had never seen before. You know, with this occurring, this woman, these policemen, that driver. So they locked me up for sure. Took me to this place, a couple of windows and with bars on the windows and uh, a sink in the corner with a stool and a, a mattress on the floor that was dirtier than any that you see discarded in the street. And I said to myself, I can't touch that. I can't lie down or sit down. And I wouldn't even wash my hands in the sink. So I paced the floor all night. I mean, you travel, you travel in dress uniform, meaning your heels, at least one and an inch, one and a half inch heel. So I paced the floor all night. And I cried and I prayed. I asked God to help me. You, you know, it was sort of like, what is happening to me? What is happening? What am I going to do? What are you going to say to your, your family? You were in jail. I sort of know how I got there, but I don't belong here. Why would I come to jail for, for the steps and moves that I've just made up to here? So all night I'm pacing the floor walking and pacing and crying, walking and pacing and crying. The jailer came the next morning, took me to the, before the chief of police, 
and the chief of police said, is that a uniform you're wearing? I said, you mean to tell me you don't know the color of the United States Army uniform? So he said to me, that's why you spent the night in jail, because you're too damn smart. All the disparaging or, or things that I've seen happen in life, you know, the mistreatment of people that I have seen. But I'd like to be remembered as someone who helped somebody along the way, you know.